Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. I don't know about you, but prophecy excites me and encourages me. Even though many of the things that we see in prophecy, they are very disturbing. They speak about hard, difficult times, things happening that no one wants to take place. But remember what Messiah Yeshua taught us in the book of Luke in chapter 21. When he says, when you see these things taking place and they're difficult things, he says, lift up your heads, meaning this that God is getting ready to acknowledge, to recognize His people. He says, lift up your heads, and how is He going to recognize us? With redemption, because He says, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. Now, that expression, lift up your heads, it can be taken in two ways, and it doesn't have to be an either or or, because God is going to recognize us, but that expression, to lift up your head can also be a term, an idiom for encouragement. And this is what it means. When God recognizes us in the last days, when He shows in a very demonstrative way that we are His covenant people, that He is going to take us to Himself, isn't that a great encouragement? And when we see these events happening, what He's telling us is this that the kingdom of God, what we should be passionate about, what we should be living based upon the reality of its coming, this is drawing near. So what we've been living for, hoping for, believing in, when these difficult times come, well, we should be encouraged, and that encouragement should give us strength to persevere and to live righteously in those days. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Daniel and chapter 11. The book of Daniel, chapter 11. We saw last week that there's going to be Malach Gibor, a very strong king that is going to rule. And now we're learning the events that's going to bring him, this unique king that does what he wants. And remember that phrase very significant when we're speaking about one who does what he wants this is a satanic driven individual one that's empowered one that is illuminated with the deception from the pit of hell see those who do the right thing are those who do not what they want but what God's will is. Remember what Messiah said on that night before he was crucified? When he said to, to his heavenly Father in the garden, not my will, I'm not here to do what I want, but he says, not my will, but your will be done. This is the difference between the real Christ and the Antichrist. The real Messiah does his Father's will. He lives a sacrificial life, a life of obedience. But the false Messiah, he is driven by the desires of his flesh. He is someone who is going to be utilized by Satan. And we saw a foreshadowing of him in last week's study. This mighty king that is going to be wealthy, this one that is going to have power, this one who's going to have influence over all the earth. And now we're going to learn as we pick up where we left off last week, we're going to see the events that will bring him into power. But once again, we need to remember something. Messiah, when he taught about the last days, he said there's going to be many wars. 
So it's not going to be that the Antichrist just suddenly is in power. That empire that he's going to rule over, it's got to come into being first. And there's going to be many wars for that to take place and ultimately for him to become the leader of that empire. See, the last days and these wars and these conflicts are not just as neat as some would have you to believe. Some look at the last days and they kind of present it as a package all wrapped up. Very neat, very clear, very uh, concise. This is not what the prophets teach. This is not what we're going to see. No, the last days, they are full, as Yeshua taught, of many battles, wars, conflicts, and great instability in the world. Well, let's continue on where we left off last week. Look, if you would, to verse 5. Now, it foreshadows, we saw in the previous verse, verse 4, it foreshadows a unique, a mighty king that does what he wants to. But now we're going to see through much of chapter 11 a conflict, a conflict between two kings. And these two, I should say really, two kingdoms. There's going to be many different kings and leaders that manifest themselves as we're going to see in the next uh, few weeks. But there's two kingdoms that are constantly at war with each other. Speaking about the king of the north and the king of the south. And what we should see here is that Israel is going to be right in the middle of all of these battles and conflicts. And we're going to see how Israel responds in the midst of these later on. But let's begin. Look, as I said, Daniel chapter 11 and verse 5. We read here, And the king of the south, remember there's going to be the king of the south and the king of the north. And the king of the south, he will grow strong, and from his officials, and this is the word sar, it's in the plural, so his main leaders. This word is used in modern Hebrew for a cabinet official, so we're talking about his primary leaders. And from his leaders, it says, he will grow strong, and he will rule a government, and powerful is his government. And the word here, I translated powerful, well, it's actually the Hebrew word rav. And it means great or abundant, something that is much more than the norm. So this kingdom that he's going to rule over is going to be one that's very strong. And who are we talking about? Well, look again at verse 5. It's the king of the south. He's going to have a very strong government. Look now to verse 6. We find a very significant phrase that appears over and over in different forms. Now, remember last week I told you about this word kets. Kets means end. And primarily we're talking about the end of this age. We're talking about the end of this world that will lead to a transition into the kingdom. And that's why I truly believe when we look at this and how this scripture's unfolding and the use of this phrase kets in many different ways, the end, I believe all of these are strong indicators that we should look at Daniel chapter 11 and go back 24, 23, 2200 years ago and focus in on Alexander the Great and what happened after he died and ultimately Antiochus Epiphanes who came and, and ruled and caused great uh, atrocities for the Jewish people. Although they are significant times, although they show us a pattern, a paradigm that, that lends itself for understanding the future, I believe the indicators from the text are that this passage has last day's implications written all over it. So look, if you would, to verse 6. It says, Uleketz shani, at the end of years. And the term years can be understood as time. 
So at the end of time, at the end of the summation of years, notice what happens. Now, there is a king of the south. But the emphasis here in this passage is going to be, and we'll see this in the weeks to come, the emphasis is on the king of the north. We know, according to many other prophecies, that the Antichrist is going to lead a vast, a great army in the last days to come to Israel with his purpose to go and destroy Jerusalem and take leadership over it. We know that he's coming from the north. So ultimately, this king, the one that we talked about last week that does what he wants to do, this king, the Antichrist, is going to in some way be connected to the north, not the south. And what's happening here? Well, the king of the south, remember we began to talk about him in verse 5. He is going to be very concerned about the growth of this king of the north. And why do I say the king of the north? Look again at verse 6. At the end of years, it says here that there's going to be a confederacy established. And it says, literally, they're going to be joined together and the daughter of the king of the south, she will come to the king of the north in order to make an agreement. Now, this is something that happens quite frequently. In order to try to establish peace, oftentimes marriages were, were utilized. They were type of a form of a treaty, that there were to be agreement and a woman would be given to a leader, whether it was to a prince sometimes or to the king himself, in order to try to make peace between these two families, in other words, these two kingdoms. And that's what we see here. We see a manly attempt, a human attempt, in order to try to bring peace because this king of the south, as strong as he is, he feels insecure by this king of the north. Look again at verse 6. There's going to be a confederacy, and it says, The daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But then it says, Velo tatsor, it will not stop, meaning this is not going to stop his power and a very important word, Zoroah. In this context, it is a military term speaking about force. So it's another word for armies. So this uh, agreement through marriage is not going to stop his power or his armies. It says he will not stop nor his armies. Read on in the second half of verse 6. And she is going to be given, meaning she's going to be rejected. Not only her, but the ones who brought her meaning brought her to this king of the north, and even the one who gave birth to her, and the one who made her strong in this time. Now, what's important here is there's two ways that we can understand that last phrase. Those who made her strong, or in the end, we're going to find that the kingdom is going to be made strong, meaning that this is not going to hold this uh, agreement, this confederacy, because the king of the north, his kingdom, is very, very strong. He, in other words, doesn't need this, this marriage, this treaty. He feels comfortable going alone. Verse, verse 7. Verse 7 teaches us, despite her rejection, we find that later on, what's going to happen? And they will stand from the sprouts of her, her roots upon his, this would be the king of the south's base. So from her offspring, there is going to come one, we use the term netzer, and that's kind of a shoot, a branch that springs forth from a stump, or in this case, from the roots. It's speaking about a new leader for this empire of the south. And what is he going to do? Well, he will come with an army and he will go into the stronghold of the king of the north and he will do 
Now, usually that word asa in Hebrew, he will do. But in this chapter, in this context, when this word asa appears, it's speaking about making war that he is going to do a battle, that he is going to make conflict. So he is going to make war with them and he's going to be strengthened. So we see a, a change whereby at one time it was the king of the north that seems to have all the power, so much so that he rejected this confederacy, this agreement, this treaty, this marriage. But now her offspring, this daughter, this, her offspring has risen up onto the pedestal of this kingdom of the south. He has come and made war and he is very strong. He's defeated, we might say, in the short term, this king of the north. And look on in verse 8. And also their gods, meaning their idols, and with the princes, their princes, with the desirable vessels of, of silver and gold, what did he do? He took them into captivity, where? To Egypt. Now, when we're speaking about the South, many times we're speaking about Egypt. Some scholars point out that Egypt is another term for Northern Africa. So not just the modern country, of, of Egypt today in those boundaries, but we're speaking about Northern Africa, much of Africa, some scholars would say. And that is because the Egyptian empire ruled over these places. So very significant information. And it says that he's gonna take these things into captivity in Egypt. And we read, which means he, years, will stand more than the king of Egypt. So this leader is going to remain longer. This leader from the south is going to remain longer than, let me translate this right, the king of the north. So once more, we're seeing that the king of the south, he has greater power at this time. Look now to verse 9. Over and over, what we see here is this conflict going back and forth between these two empires, what the scriptures call the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. It began with the north being the most powerful, but now in this next generation, we see just the opposite. It is the king of the south, but notice what happens. In verse 9, and he comes, who's that? Well, context would lead us to conclude it's the king of the north. And the king of the north, he will come into the kingdom or the king of the south. So once more, another conflict. And he will return to his own land, meaning he will come, do battle, he will be successful, and he'll go back to his own land victoriously. Verse 10. What's going to happen? Well, we find here that the sons, the sons of the north, they are going to stir up and gather a great multitude of many soldiers and they will come and they are going to pass over. Now, this is the word for overflowing. It's a word that is reminiscent of a flood and realize in Hebrew, there are two words for flood. We have the word like in Noah's flood, which is the Hebrew word mabul. Mabul has to do with water just rising up. But this is the word more likely to the Hebrew term shitaphon, which is a flood where the waters come rushing through. Like if a dam were to break and the waters just come or a tsunami, something in that sense. And that's how this army is described. Look again. We read, and his sons will stir up, meaning they're going to make conflict, and they are going to gather a multitude of many soldiers. And he will certainly come in this, this fast way. He's going to pass over, and we see here that he's going to return, but he's still going to stir up, meaning this battle 
unto the strongholds. And what's that? The stronghold for the king of the south. So in this next generation, it's going to be the north that, that, that takes its position of leadership. Look at verse 11. It goes back and forth. Verse 11. And the king of the south, he will be angry. And this word for anger, well, we read about it in verse or chapter 8. It is a word of intense, intense hatred. He will be enraged. That is, the king of the south will be enraged. He will go forth and he will fight with him, meaning with the king of the north. But we read, and, and this would be the king of the north, he will stand a multitude, a great multitude, meaning when this king of the south comes, the king of the north is going to be ready. And he is going to put up this great multitude. But notice what it says. This multitude will be given into his hand, meaning into the hands of the king of the south. So now, once again, the power is back with the south. Look at verse 12. We find here that he, speaking about the king of the south, he is going to lift up this multitude, meaning he has put them aside. And in doing so, his heart is going to be raised up, meaning very powerful. He is going to cast many down, many multitudes down, but he will not be strong. So even though he's victorious, his victory is not going to lead to him being empowered for a long period of time. What's going to happen? Well, once more, we see that the king of the north is going to rise up. Why do I say that? Well, look, if you would, to verse 13. And the king of the north, he will return. And he will cause to stand, that is to establish, also a great multitude, greater than the first time. And then look at the middle of verse 13. Have a very important word. Remember verse 6 where it says, Leketz Shanim, at the end of years or time? Well, we have another expression. It says, Uleketz Ha'itim Shanim, which means at the end of times and years. Now, it is expression that leads us to the conclusion that indeed we're talking about the last days. And what's going to happen? Well, notice, continue on in verse 13. And he will certainly come. Who's going to come? This king of the north. He's going to do so with a great army and with great assets, abundant assets with him. So he is going to want to wage war once more against the king of the south. Now, here's what we should conclude. If indeed we're talking about the last days, what we see is exactly what Yeshua taught, that in the last days there's going to be battles and wars and conflict. One kingdom is going to rise up against another kingdom, one nation against another nation. And that's what this is describing to us. So it fits, not necessarily, what the historians want us to gather from this. It hits the prophecy of Yeshua perfectly. It, it checks the boxes that he reveals in that Olivet Discourse from Matthew 24, from Mark 13, and from Luke chapter 21. It also agrees with the prophets who taught that same thing that in the last days there's going to be numerous battles and conflicts and that Israel's going to be stuck in the middle. Well, continue on, look at verse 14. And in those times, here again, what times? Well, we have to go back to verse 13, where it says, at the end of the times of years. So again, another more precise terminology that we're talking about the end of, the times of years, this final portion of time, the last days. Look again, verse 14. And in those times, many will stand, and here's an important truth. Many will stand, 
Nagev. Many will stand, and the word is al. It can be concerning. Now, in regard to. Now, some will say against. Other translations will say with, because. The word here is not uh, for certain. But the context will tell us. I do not believe that it's against the king of the south, but rather it's in regard to why. Well, because in reality, it is that king of the north that is going to be, as we'll see, the problem king, where the Antichrist comes from. So there's going to be those many who stand with the king of the south. And look at the second part of verse, verse 14, and we see, and the sons or the children of, now some Bibles will say robbers, and it's a word to means to burst forth. So if you burst into some place, you may be a robber. But the word here is literally speaking about those who burst, meaning who, who transgress the law of God. Those who are not obedient, obedient, they're violators of your people. And what we find here in trying to defeat the king of the north, you're going to see that there are those from the Jewish people that are going to side with the king of the south in order to, notice what it says, that they might lift up and establish the vision. What vision? This, this, this vision that we talked about of establishing the king, kingdom of Israel. They believe if they work with the south, and we see something historically. Don't we find over and over in the scriptures that Israel, for safety, Israel because of a lack of faith in God, what do they do? They try to go back to Egypt. They want to make alliances with Egypt. They're constantly turning to Egypt for security. And this is what they're doing in order that their kingdom might be established. We know something. We know that the kingdom of God is not going to be established because of assistance from Egypt. No, it's God that brings about. The people, I'm speaking about the children of Israel, we need to learn to trust God, rely upon Him and not in military confederacies with Egypt. That's the message here. And unfortunately, what happened earlier on in Israel's history, when they came out of Egypt and thereafter, they were constantly looking towards Egypt to help rather than God. Now, this scripture is going to share that Israel needs to trust God and no one else. And that's a message for all of us. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.